Hi everybody, my name is Dia Nagraj, the Associate Curator of Exhibitions here at the Museum of Danish America. In today's Brown Bag Lunch, which is sponsored by the Kofod Family Foundation, we will be speaking with Julia, our American intern, who has been working on the textile collection. So she'll be speaking a little bit about collections management and the textile inventory process, and showing you some of the really interesting objects that she's been working with. Hello, I'm Julia. I'm the collections assistant intern here at the Museum of Danish America. And today I'm coming to you from one of our collection storage vaults. I'm gonna be chatting with you a little bit about collections management, taking you behind the scenes, talking about some of the tools of collections management, the inventory process that I've been working on, and showing you a few different objects as well and sharing some cool stories. So to start with, just to kind of set the stage for you of where we are here, like I said, this is a collection storage vault. Um, this space houses primarily our textile collection, and that's what you see behind me on our shelves here. Um, they're housed in our archival collections boxes, and they're kind of grouped together uh, like with like. So wedding gowns, things like that, are all kind of together in their boxes and then grouped together on these shelves. Um, this is the collection that I primarily work with, the textile collection, and that's what I've been doing this inventory project on. Since you're not here, I'll also let you know that this space is about 64 degrees with a 32% relative humidity. So it's pretty chilly in here, but that's good for our collections and it helps to keep them in as good condition as we possibly can. Um, but it means that I'm always wearing a sweater because it's very chilly in here. Um, before I get started kind of talking about our inventory process and what that means and what that all kind of entails, I thought I would share with you some of the tools that I use pretty frequently and that I've used since I've been here at the museum. To start with, since I just mentioned temperature and humidity, I'll show you this little guy. So this is a Hobo data logger. Hobo is kind of the brand name of this, but it records the temperature and the humidity in whatever space it's in every 30 minutes. And so they're positioned all around the museum. If you've been here before or if you come in the future, you might see these and you might kind of wonder what they are, but now you'll know. So it's recording temperature and humidity. I go around the museum once a month and I gather these all up and I download the data that's contained on here. And then we can actually look at temperature and humidity fluctuations over that past month. We can see it in kind of a graph form or just in a list. And that's important because we need to know what's going on in the environment that our collections are in and that our museum spaces and exhibition um, exhibitions are in as well. So, of course, we don't want to see any big kind of fluctuations. And what's great is that, especially in this space, we don't have that. We keep it pretty stable, and that's what we really want. If I were to look at the data from one of our little hobos that are by a door to the outside, those have a much greater fluctuation when you're looking at the data because people are coming in and out. So you get more of that range as that's happening. So that is our hobo data logger. Another very important tool of collections management that I use all the time are gloves. So these are our nitrile gloves that we use. Um, some museums use cotton, but most kind of use the nitrile, and that's kind of the, the standard right now. They're good for a lot of different materials, handling a lot of different materials. And of course we use them because we don't want any dirt or grime or oils that are secreted by our fingers to get onto our collections objects. So I'm always wearing these whenever I'm handling our textile collection. Um, fun fact, ours are purple because our collections, um, curator of collections slash registrar loves purple, so she often orders the purple gloves. But we do have some black gloves flying around here somewhere too. Other things, tape measure, always very important. Um, when I'm going through and doing the inventory process, sometimes it'll, I'll come across a record that needs a little bit more development. It might need another measurement, maybe a measurement was missed, or a measurement might seem like it doesn't quite make sense for whatever the object is, so I'll double check it using our handy tape measure. So that's always on hand and we keep those there. Something else that I'll grab and bring over, tissue paper. 
seems like a very kind of basic thing and something that we might not think about as a majorly important thing in collections management, but actually I use tissue paper constantly, particularly with the textile collection. Tissue paper is used in our archival boxes to kind of line the box so that the objects aren't coming into contact with directly with the box itself. They're used to separate objects from one another so that they're not rubbing against each other, touching each other, causing harm to each other. And then they're also used to pad any folds that need to occur so that there's not a sharp line and a sharp crease which over time can tear. Um, they're also used to kind of pad out clothing um, so that it keeps its shape a little bit better and is preserved in kind of the shape that it should be. We have two types of tissue paper that we use here. We have buffered and unbuffered. This is the buffered, this is the unbuffered, and it depends on the type of material that you're working with with the textiles, depending on which one you want to use for that. So buffered is good for and I'll try to give you as best of an explanation as I can, not being a chemistry kind of person. But buffered is really good for cellulose um, or, or um, like plant-based materials like cotton, linen, and jute. And it's because it has an alkaline reserve within the tissue. And so any, um, that's good for neutralizing any acidity that can build up in those objects and then try to kind of migrate out of those objects. So that stops that. The unbuffered is good for um, textiles that are protein-based or animal-based. So that would be like wool or silk. And those materials are sensitive to alkaline. So this actually has a neutral pH because of that sensitivity. So that works better for those materials. Unbuffered is also the choice when I don't know the fiber content of an object. It's kind of the safest choice for that. And it's also good for particularly delicate items because it's a little bit of a softer tissue paper. So that can be a bit better when you're trying to do that. So it seems very basic, but clearly there's kind of a lot of info going on with our tissue paper, even some chemistry things that are going on as well, depending on how we use these things. So it's very important and we use it all of the time in collections management. So other things, our camera is also an important thing here. Um, this, whenever I'm going through and doing the inventory process, I always check if there are any additional photos that need to be taken. Um, and occasionally there are if, you know, a back of something was missed or something like that. So I always have the camera on hand. We use the Canon G7X, not sponsored, but it works really nicely. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more other considerations that our communication specialist would know because she's a photographer. But I really like it because it has this nice tilt out screen there. So when I'm trying to take an overhead picture, I can actually see if I'm getting it in the shot, which is great. Other things, these little sleeves, these are archival polyester Melanex sleeves. I'm not sure how well you can see it because they're just clear. But these are really good for small objects, small little textiles, something that's really kind of like a delicate little doily or something like that, that might need a little bit more support and also could easily kind of get lost in the tissue paper as I'm kind of pulling things out. So it's nice to have a little more stability and make it a little more clear that there is something there. This can help with that. It's also just a little folder guy that opens like this. So it allows air movement in there as well, which is better than having like a little plastic baggie that would be sealed because any moisture that would be in there would then cause mold and we wouldn't want that. So having that airflow is really good as well. Um, next up, I thought I should mention accession numbers and how that all works. I'll show you quickly an example of an accession number. So on this object, I'll spin this around, we have our accession number on the back right here. This one is 93.5.35. And so that accession number, you might have probably seen them if you've gone to the museum and looked at an object label, will often have the accession number right on that object label. And if you've ever wondered what that is, 
That accession number is what links the physical object to all of its documentation. So our hard copy files that are about the object, our past perfect database where we have our records about the object, that number is what connects that physical object to that information. And whenever objects are officially accessioned into the museum, they're legally brought in as a part of the collection, they're given a unique accession number so that we can link all of that together and find everything that we need to find. And the way that number works, so I mentioned with this one, let me see if I can find that number again. This one's number is 93.5.35. So what that means, it has a three part number. That's how most museums do it, although sometimes there might be a little bit of variation depending on the kind of collection or what's going on in the museum. In this case, that first number is the date, the year that it was accessioned. So 93, 1993. The second number is the number of the gift that came into the museum during that year. So in this case, five. So this was the fifth kind of group accession that came into the museum within 1993. And then that last number is the number of the object within that gift. So this is the 35th object within that fifth gift within 1993. So we know that that gift included at least 35 objects, but it might have included more as well. And then the numbers can get more complicated from there as we go on. The other thing I wanted to talk about with accession numbers is how we attach them and the materials that we use for that. Um, so one of the things that we use is actually an archival ink pen. And it looks a little like this. So this is our archival ink pen. And we use this to write on this material called Tyvek. It's kind of like paper, but it's a little sturdier. It's a little hardier. Um, and we use that to write the number onto a little rectangle of the Tyvek. This is fade proof. It's waterproof. It doesn't smear. Um, and it doesn't bleed. So that makes it really good for the collections. Um, the Tyvek, we used to use this material called twill tape, but it's a little easier to read the number when it's on a material like this rather than our twill tape, so kind of switched over to doing this. That little rectangle of Tyvek is then attached to the object, usually in a place where it's a little more sturdy or has a little more thickness to it. Um, for clothing, it's often up around like a neckline where there's a seam that it can kind of grip onto there, and so definitely not in a very delicate area. And it's attached with two or three stitches on either side of that little rectangle. And we want to make sure that it stays on, but we don't ever want to do anything that kind of permanently alters or damages the object. So just a very light kind of tacking on of those little stitches there. So that's our accession number and how we attach those. The last kind of tool that I wanted to mention and I wanted to bring up is actually bug sticky traps, um, which you might not have been expecting, but is also kind of a very important part of collections management because we want to know what kinds of pests are coming into the museum. We want to know how many pests are coming into the museum and we want to be sure that we're monitoring that so that we know if there's a problem, if there's an infestation that needs to be addressed so that it can't harm any of our objects. So again, if you're kind of, if you've been through the museum before, or if you come again, eventually in the future, you might see little bug traps like this. These are just sticky traps that are positioned throughout the museum. And like I said, they're sticky. There's a little covering on it right now. This is a fresh and clean one, so there's no bugs on it. But these are positioned usually along walls um, so that it's kind of a natural place for a bug to be kind of walking along and then get stuck on the sticky trap. Once a month, I go around kind of like with the hobos and I take a look at all of these and I record the location that they're in, what kind of bugs are on these traps and how many are there. And usually, thank goodness, while I've been here, there's been no real problems with the bugs. It's been kind of incidental things that have come in. And that's okay, and we kind of expect that within the museum. You're always gonna have at least a few bugs coming in every once in a while, so nothing to be worried about. Although one time I did find a snake in our archivist's office, which was the most exciting thing I found in one of these bug traps. Um, and it actually ended up being still alive and we were able to save it with help from our prairie maintenance staff person. Um, and we released it back onto the prairie. So hopefully he's living out his life somewhere out there now. 
Um, bugs that would be concerning if we saw a lot of them all of a sudden in one location, that could in indicate kind of an infestation. If we saw a lot of larder beetles, those are bad for wood collections. So if we saw a lot of that, we'd be worried about our wood objects. Um, Silverfish are bad for paper collections. Um, so if we saw a lot of those, particularly around our paper, that could be concerning. And with the textiles, um, one of the things to be most worried about are the clothes webbing moths. Um, so any of those would be very kind of concerning within our textile spaces. And we actually have a separate type of trap for catching the moths or for checking moths. So this is actually a moth trap. It's pretty similar to the sticky trap. It's also sticky on the inside, but we hang it up a little bit higher and then it's open like this so that moths can fly through and get caught. This one has been up since August and there's never been anything in it. So that's good so far. No moths are in this space, so that's great. So that is kind of all of these tools of the trade that I wanted to mention that I've been using while I've been here. But now I wanted to touch on the inventory project that I've been working on with the textile collection. Inventory is another one of these things that doesn't sound very exciting, but is really important um, when we're thinking about collections management and making sure that our collections stay preserved and stay in good condition. Um, with inventory, you're basically double checking all of the locations for all of the objects in your collection. So you're making sure that you have accurate records of where everything is and it's all kind of housed properly and all of that. And it's important because we as a museum kind of have a responsibility to the public to be stewards and caretakers of these objects of this collection. And so we want to make sure to do that. Um, and part of doing that is doing the inventory process. It also is good because it lets us have eyes on all of our collection. Actually going through and seeing everything is really important because it lets you know if there's any condition issues that have sprung up in the intervening time. You can do kind of you know routine maintenance. Um, any kind of routine cleaning that needs to happen can happen at that point as well. So it's really important. And it's also all part of preservation, which is what we're trying to do with these objects. We want to keep them um, at the point that they're in now, right? We don't want any further deterioration to occur or anything like that. So inventory is all part of that, all part of preserving these objects for which we are the caretakers. So to do an inventory, what I do is I go out to the office space and I pull up our Excel inventory list. We have all of our records in Past Perfect, which is our database management system. Um, but we also have kind of a backup Excel list that just lists the inventory locations, the names of the objects, the accession numbers, and the date they were last checked. So I print out a list that looks something like this. And I just print out the boxes I'm planning on working on that day, usually kind of one shelf at a time. I'll then take this and I'll do a little pre-check of the past perfect database system just to make sure that everything is as complete as possible within that record. Because I'll need to know if I need to take any pictures or do any measurements like what I mentioned before while I'm in the box itself. It doesn't really work to have gone through the box already and then go back and realize that I need to take photos or do measurements. So I do that little pre-check and just kind of look over those things, check if there's a condition report, check that the description is as full as it could be, um, and I check the materials as well to know what type of tissue that I'm gonna be using in that box. I then take after I've noted anything that needs to be noted. I then take that back into this space, our vault here. I pull out the box that I wanna work with first and I take all of its contents out. I replace the tissue paper at the bottom of the box and then I start going through, taking each object one by one, checking for its accession number, checking off that object once I've found the accession number on my list, and then I add it back to the box. And as I'm doing that, I'm replacing all of the tissue paper. Something that I didn't mention when I was talking about that tissue paper is that over time, because we talked about kind of the acidity with these objects and things that can kind of migrate out of them, over time, those, um, the tissue paper actually absorbs material. So we need to change them out every few years so that they can still kind of effectively protect the collections. 
So as I'm going through, I'm changing out all of that tissue that's separating each object, as well as any support tissue that's padding folds um, or padding out garments and kind of keeping their shape in that way. So I'm replacing all of that as I go. When I've got everything back in the box, I finish with another piece of tissue paper at the top, and then I close up the box. And then I check, there's actually a list on the outside of the box of all of the contents of that box. So I cross check that with my printed out list. I note if there's anything that was in the box that I didn't know was going to be in the box, I make sure that that's added to the outside and it's added to my sheet over here as well. Um, so I check that off and then I go through and I list um, on the outside of the box the date that the tissue paper was changed and the date that it next needs to be changed. So you can look at a glance and see when that needs to be taken care of. I then take this back to my desk. I update the Excel list with any changes that came up when I was going through. And then I go into Pass Perfect and I do the same there, making sure that all of those locations are correct, filling out the record as best as I can with any additional information or additional photos, any of that. Sometimes there will be a case where perhaps the provenance of an object, kind of that you know, who owned it, where did it come from, all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes that might not be as full as it could be. So I'll go into our records room and I'll pull the actual hard copy accession file and take a look at that and see if there's anything that needs to be added to that record. So that's another part of kind of going through the past perfect database and doing that. I'm also doing kind of a little spelling and grammar check as well. Since our database is accessible through our website, we want to make sure that that's as well written as possible so that when people are looking at it, they're having a good experience and not having to wade through a lot of misspellings and grammar mistakes. Um, the other thing too, when I'm going through and kind of finishing up that inventory process, sometimes there will be objects that we might not have any provenance for, so we don't know anything about it, any of its history, where it came from, um, who owned it, any of that. And so sometimes I will recommend those things as possible deaccessions. Um, the other time that happens when I recommend things for deaccessioning is if we have duplicative items. So a lot of like one item of the same thing, we probably don't need to have a ton of them. So those also might be recommended for deaccessioning. Anything that's done that's recommended for deaccessioning then goes through an approval process with our collections committee and our board. So it's actually harder to get things out of the museum than it is to get them in, which is the way it should be, because we should be thinking carefully about like what we're bringing in um, and if we want to kind of keep it and care for it and if it fits with our mission statement. So that all has to be kind of carefully considered. So we've covered tools. We've covered the inventory process as well. Hopefully you're still with me, still hanging in there. Now I thought for fun to kind of shake things up a little bit that we could talk about a few objects and take a look at them. So I will start with this pillow over here. So this guy, And I'll see if I can tilt this up to show you. So this guy is a decorative throw pillow and I love it. It's one of the kind of earliest objects that I encountered when I started doing the inventory and it really just jumped out at me. I love it um, aesthetically. I think it's really cool looking and then it has a very cool story behind it. So it looks kind of scrappy as you're looking at it, but all of these different rectangles are actually ribbons and these come from dairymen and creamery conventions and the dates range from 1902 to 1931. And then in the center, there's actually a little pin that says, Stand by Your Home Creamery. And this was made by um, Hedvig Anderson Carlson. Um, and she made this for her father as a Christmas present. So all of these different ribbons were actually his because um, he was a creamery operator himself in Minnesota. And so she made this for him. I just love that story. I think it's very cool. And then it just is such a cool object. It looks very cool as well. Um, and her father, Julius, he was actually from Denmark. Um, he and his wife both were, and they immigrated over. Um, the other kind of interesting thing to talk about with this, it actually was previously on display in one of our exhibitions um, 
and I'm not sure how long it was on display, but it was taken off display in November of 2000. So if you were there before that, you might have seen this object. But the concern was fading actually from being on display. So that's something else we have to think about with our textiles is the light levels that they're being exposed to and how long they're being exposed to them. So how long they're on exhibition and how much that light is affecting them. So we have to be very careful about that. So that is one of my favorite objects. Another that I thought I would show is this kind of small quilt here. So this was made by Lottie Christensen and she made it in 1995. And she talked a little bit about, we have a quote from her in our records about what inspired her to make this piece. And she was actually thinking about, for one thing, she kind of saw this design in a, an Art Nouveau magazine. And so that kind of Art Nouveau style is coming from this design that she saw in a magazine. But it also reminded her of this feeling that she had um, back when she was a single mother and she was actually taking extra night shifts over the weekend. So her only weekend day was Friday. So she titled this piece, Thank God It's Friday, because when she saw this design, it made her think of that feeling of it being a Friday and just kind of being able to relax and release and kick back in just kind of a sea of pillows like this. So she created this piece. Um, like I said, it was made in 1995 and it was exhibited in 1996 at the Tucson Quilters Guild annual show. Um, what's interesting about that is it actually caused quite a stir. There was a little bit of controversy with this piece because of the nude motif here of this nude woman that we have. So she was actually almost expelled from the Tucson Quilters Guild. And I kind of love that story. I love a little bit of subversive quilting going on. I think that's pretty fun and pretty cool. And Lottie herself was also just a very cool person. Um, she was from Copenhagen, Denmark. And she was a master potter. She was a medical technician. And then also this, you know, fabulous fabric artist as well, who was a member of the Tucson Quilters Guild and also kind of a leader within that organization as well. So that's another fun one that I love. Another kind of cool object here is this gown. And this is actually a wedding dress, um, which might be kind of surprising since it's this lovely like blue satin color. Um, our wedding dresses, I think, are probably one of our most popular things in our collection, and we have quite a few wedding dresses. Um, some that have kind of the full, like, complement of the outfit, from the veil to the shoes to everything. We have others that have, you know, multiple outfits from the same wedding party, which is kind of fun as well. This particular one, like I said, is a wedding gown, and it's this lovely blue satin. This is Lena Rasmussen's dress. She wore it in 1913 to her wedding to Carl Rasmussen. And um, she had immigrated in 1902. And her and Carl, before they got married, they actually took a trip back to Denmark to visit Carl's family. And they were riding bikes while they were there. And she actually, Lena actually overexerted herself and had a flare up of tuberculosis. And she ended up having to spend a year in a sanitarium in Oakdale, Iowa, I think, um, before she kind of recovered. And then went to Atlantic and learned how to sew there. And then made this dress, which she wore in 1913. So again, these kind of really interesting histories that you get to find out while you're doing this inventory process and sorting through these objects, getting to handle them, getting to touch them, and then getting to read the histories as well. Um, it's a real privilege that, to get to do this. And this one, it's also particularly lovely, some of the details that we have here of the beading um, on this, these different spaces. And you'll notice some of the tissue paper I've removed just to kind of show it here. But when it goes back into its box, the tissue will be used to help the skirt because we do have to kind of fold the skirt in a little bit. Um, so that'll be used to pad those folds. And then tissue is also used to prevent the beads that are here from scratching on the material or catching the material at all as well. And then it's also being used to kind of pad out our sleeves there too. So tissue, again, playing a very important role here. The final object that I wanted to share doesn't have quite as, you know, quite as much of a history as some of these other objects do, 
but this little cloth fragment, which has just some lovely embroidery on it there, as well as some ribbon work too. So this was made by Bertine Jensen Norgard. Um, and she came over in 1906, and she probably made this while she was still in Denmark before she came in 1906. And really, I don't have any more information other than that. We have more information about Bertine herself and her husband and how they came over together and settled and all of these different things. But for this particular object, I don't really know much more about it. But I love it because not only just the beautiful embroidery and the work that she did, but I also love learning about things that were so important to people that they were brought over with them, that kind of significance of the object. Um, that even if I don't know exactly what it was, I know that there was some significance to it, which makes it cool as well to see that and kind of understand that. So again, just these histories and these backgrounds of these objects are so cool, in addition to the objects themselves being really fantastic. So that was all of the objects that I had to share with you, as well as the tools and the inventory process that we talked about. Um, thank you so much for joining me today um, on this little behind the scenes adventure. I hope that you learned something or found something interesting and maybe that you're coming away from this little talk with a bit more appreciation for the collections management stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Please feel free to ask questions in the comment section and Julia will be answering them later today.